So glad to have everyone here. We just want to remind you tomorrow we'll have uh, the building open from uh, 4 to 6.30 for the uh, treasures and treats uh, for the Halloween people. So if you want to stop by, you're welcome. If you don't, like our house, we don't get that many people trick-or-treating at the Parsonage, but uh, we can come here and share our treats and, and help bless other people and give them the love. We'll have cocoa and coffee and things like that for people to enjoy. So you're welcome to stop by. Um, also, and so that's the big announcement this week. Don't forget next Sunday, turn your clocks back, fall back. Uh, I guess we're still doing that. And, um, and the big debate. And also that uh, we'll have All Saints celebration next Sunday. So we're glad uh, for those. So that's all we've got going on this week. After a big week last week, we thank for everybody who helped out with our big fall celebration, our flannel fl fun fling I never do get it right. <laughs> that may have been right. It was a lot of fun. Stacy did a great job taking pictures. A lot of you came with your flannel and you looked really awesome. So good job. Thank you, Stacy. And team effort, team effort. I know, but you did a lot of it. So thank you so much. Yeah, the evangelist committee. But thank you all. Great treats. So we had a great time. So we'll have that fun. Happy birthday to everybody having birthdays this week. Uh, Verla, Shelly, lots of you folks having birthdays this week. So happy birthday. Hey, Ken, happy birthday, and Kevin and Shelly are having their anniversary, so congratulations. 
Happy anniversary. Well, Amelia, happy birthday. We're sorry we didn't have that on there. Write it on our sheet and we'll put it in. Sorry. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Let's stand together and sing our praise. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we gather in this place to feel again your gentle touch and experience your powerful presence. We ask that our voices, as they unite in song and praise, that we can come alive with a new sense of the birth you offer each of us. And that our time together may empower us uh, to meet and greet others in the coming day with your love. 
to remind them of your presence in this world and in and your desire to welcome them into your family. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. Well, we'll invite the children and youth forward. It's their time this morning. Oh, good. Here comes our Good News crew. Good morning. You want to come, Amelia? Good morning. Come on over. Hi, guys. <clears throat> Oh, lots of little friends today. Yep. Awesome. If you want to sit so you can see right out there. How is everybody today? Good? <laughs> good. Smiles. That's good. Okay. What do we think might be in here today? Do you hear anything? What do we think? Want to take a guess? Candy. candy. Nope, not candy. Somebody guessed an avocado last time. <laughs> yeah, that's because that we funny. talked about an avocado at kids club, so that was good. Somebody said straw or hay. Nope, there might be some left over from Sunday, but nope, that's not it. Mm -hmm. Shall we figure it out? Okay. Ta-da! Do we know what it is? A map. Awesome. Great job. And do we know what kind? It's a special kind of map. It shows us about the whole, the whole world, not just, our, not just our state or our country, but the whole world. So this is a road map. And the world is so big. And if you're going on a trip, you have to kind of map out where you're going or you might get lost. You might take a wrong turn. And if you're traveling from here to here, you kind of have to know what road are you supposed to get on, what exit are you supposed to take, where's the gas station, where's the Casey's in case I need to go to the bathroom or I need to get a snack. <laughs> And um, where am I going to spend the night? So I need to know what the plan is so that I can have a safe and fun trip. Well, do you know that our lives are like a road map? And there will be lots of things that we'll be planning. We'll plan where we go to school, where we're going to live and what we're going to be when we grow up. Anybody have any ideas what you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? A police oh, officer. Oh, how wonderful. Awesome. You have a good idea. We had somebody last time who said an archaeologist, so that was awesome. And we have lots of time to think about those things. Delaney, have any ideas what you want to be? Firefighter, oh, so we have two next generation protect and serve. How awesome is that? Wonderful. That's great. So sometimes we have all these plans, but we need some guidance and direction from God to tell us where we're going, but we don't think we're getting any, and we have questions. Like, I don't know the map. I'm not sure what the next decision is. I don't know which way to go. Well, God always gives us those answers, but not always when we want them. It's sometimes his way or in his plan. So the world is very big and there are lots of choices. And we don't always know where it will be, but God does. So if we don't know, should we be anxious and afraid if we don't know what the plan is? We should not because we have faith that God will tell us and help us when we need to know. And that will help keep us calm and we don't need to be afraid. All right, so let's ask the congregation to help us read a Bible verse. For I know the plans, the plans I, I have, have for you, you declares, declares the Lord. Lord. Plans, plans to, to prosper you, you and not, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. 11. So many times, God's plans are different than ours. 
And we might not always like that because our plan might be, I'm going to sit with my best friend at lunch. Sounds like a good plan. But God's plan may be, oh, I want you to sit over there instead and make a new friend. And we might not want to follow the plan, but God's plans are always the best plans because God is God and he would never steer us wrong. So the next time that you look at a map, remember that God is looking at one too, the map for your life and enjoy the ride. And if you don't know where you're going yet, that's okay. Have faith and trust. Be calm because God does have a plan. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, dear God, thank you. Thank you for being our roadmap, for being our roadmap and giving us and giving us directions, directions when we need them, when we need them that match your plan, that match your plan for us, for us. Fill us, fill us with trust, with trust and faith, and faith on our roadmap, on our roadmap of life, of life. We love you. We love you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you guys Amen. for your good Thank listening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> he wants to stay with us, <laughs> which we all would love. <laughs> well, as we come to our time of sharing, um, one of the wonderful things that God gives us on a roadmap is plenty of good gifts. And part of our giving, a part of that God has given to us, our receiving, means that we can also give out. And so I hope that today, with joy and thanksgiving, you can present your gifts to the Lord. And as you do so, please fill out your attendance register and, and make sure if there's any messages you need to see, send up to the pulpit that you'll do so at this time. So please, with joy and thanksgiving, let's present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Will the ushers please come forward and let's join in singing our next Song of praise, glorious day. Just kidding. 
together. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, it will be a glorious day when you return, but you invite us to live into glory here and now. And so as part of our living into our faith, we just ask that you accept our offerings that we have been given, that you multiply them, and help us, O Lord, to use all our resources, Uh, not only our financial resources, but the resources of our time, our talents, our love, uh, to share the good news of Jesus with others so they can be welcomed into his family. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name, and all God's people say, amen. Well, today, friends, we're going to be looking at a scripture from Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians is a book that's written to the church in Ephesus by Paul, but it's also a broader epistle that was shed through, shared throughout all the uh, church at that time, and um, that's why it became a part of the canon. It's such an important book for us to look at. So as we look at these verses, I invite you to explore Ephesians a little more and study it more in depth. It's got some really powerful uh, truths of our faith in it, worthy of study and meditation. So let's share together verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Amen. Well, as I said, the grand scope of this letter to the Ephesians is this hope we have Because of Christ Jesus. You and I are called to live into this hope. And it's a grand hope. It's a present we're given that we can open up. We're chosen by God. The scripture tells us we're set apart uh, in Jesus Christ. Other passages in the Bible remind us that we are adopted into God's family. But this powerful gift, many refuse to open. Many refuse to believe that they are really called by God or part of God's family. Many of us run around acting like we're the plus one. Have you ever been to a family gathering that wasn't your family and you were the plus one? I, I have went to parties as the plus one back in the day, um, especially when I was single. I had other single friends and they needed a person to go with them, and and I would go as their plus one because you know I like parties, <laughs> so that was always an enjoyable thing. But it, you know it can be awkward to be the plus one, and too many people of faith act like we're the plus one. We act like we're not fully adopted into God's family, that we're not really part of the family. We're this extra person that because we came with someone else, God tolerates or welcomes us in in God's graciousness, but we're not really part of the family. And so that's a powerful truth that Paul seeks to celebrate and lift up into this passage. You and I are part of the family. 
that we are not just someone dragged along. We belong as children of God. We have been adopted in, whether we're Jewish or not. We know the Jews are God's chosen people, but so are we. God has chosen people who believe in Jesus as his children. And it's not just us, but actually God has chosen all of us. And if we choose, if we then choose to receive it, then we can live into the blessings that God has in store for us. And we can have revealed to us this wonderful plan that God has laid out for us. Because as God's beloved children, we're heirs with Christ. And there's a grand inheritance awaiting us, but not just in the future, here and now. And that's the hope we can live into. And when we live into that hope, that gives us a peace and tranquility that makes us contagiously calm if we choose to unwrap the gift and live into it. Now, I don't know about any of you, but Paul and I used to like to watch Antiques Roadshow. We haven't watched it in a while, but this week, it just earlier this week, it just happened to turn it on at the right time, and I was so intrigued by what they were talking about on there. Paul and I are always interested, my husband Paul and I are always interested in how much things go for. We'll see a beautiful piece of furniture come out, and it'll be polished and look so beautiful. And the um, appraiser will look at the family and he'll go, "Mm, did you refinish that? And then you know, bad news. You just ruined the price of it. And another piece will come out and it's black and maybe chipped on top and they'll be so excited. Oh, it has the original finish on it. And Paul and I would say, we're not sure we want that in our house. Oh, it's worth a, you know, $50,000 $50,000 or something. Well, this week when I was watching, they had a music stand, and that's what this is, a music stand, although it wasn't the one they had on there. And I had not seen one like that, and I did think it looked like a nice piece of furniture, but it's a stand to hold sheet music for when every house used to have pianos and organs, and, and you used to have a lot of sheet music before we all went digital, and so you had to have a place to hold it. And it was a dark piece of furniture, as I said. It didn't look any spectacular. It did have a small inlay on the front that was simple, and it looked nice. But again, it didn't look spectacular. And the man told the story that him and his wife had bought this cabin, not even a house. They brought a cabin, so up in the woods in, I think, northern Wisconsin somewhere, from their family, extended family, And they bought it several years ago for $26,000. And they bought the furnishings, all the furniture inside, for another $1,000. So they had a $27,000 investment in this cabin that they went to for weekends and whatnot. So they had some friends visiting. And one of the friends that recently insisted that that music cabinet that they had was worth some money. He was just confident of it. And the guy is just like, this music cabin that my family ha- cabinet that my family has in a cabin is worth a lot. I don't think so. But somehow he managed to get it on Antiques Roadshow. I'm impressed on that effort too, if you've ever explored that at all. Paul and I like to watch it too, because we're always hoping something we'll have will show up that might be worth something, but of course that never happens. Still got to keep working. So the appraiser, the, I, this one appraiser, I really like him because he's, he's got this, this complete, he just keeps his face completely, you don't know anything about what he's going to say. And when he starts talking, you don't even know then, but he goes, yeah, he goes, you know, this was made by so-and-so who worked for so-and-so. And he could even, he knew it so well, he could tell him approximately the date it was made. It was shocking. I was like, wow, he really knows his stuff. And he dated it and stuff. And he said, and you have the original finish on there. You haven't done anything to it. And he goes, yeah. He goes, you know, how much do you think this is worth? And and he goes, well, I'll tell you. He said, this thing's worth $80,000 to $100,000. $80,000 to $100,000. And the guy said, what did you say you paid for that cabin? 26,000, 27 with the furnishings. 
That thing was worth, and the guy, he was just dumbfounded. He's like, are you telling me? He goes, yes, I'm telling you. This is worth eighty dollars to $100,000. And I, we were just shocked. That was a wonderful surprise for them. But have you ever seen when they do baseball paraphernalia and baseball stuff? And so, uh, as you know, my husband is a big Cardinals fan, and I'm trying to be a Cardinals fan, too. And... Um, we're always interested when baseball stuff comes up, like, now this isn't a bat that ba- Babe Ruth owned. This is a bat I found on the internet. But it could be. But of course, it, what they want to know when this stuff comes up is the provenance. Who owned it? Where's the line of, 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 of ownership? How do you know that this really is? Somebody after church told me there was a, I think he said McLean, Steve McLean's uh, Trans, no, it was, a, it was a Mustang, a green Mustang from way back when sold for $3.5 million. I don't know, crazy. But you had to prove the provenance, of course. And so I was, we were wondering, you know, as baseball fans, we've been watching uh, Albert Pujols. He's a big home run hitter for those who aren't baseball fans. I know not everybody is. And uh, he hit a home run, and people in the stands would catch the ball. And so they were interviewing as he got closer and closer to the 700 mark, you know, 698, whatever ball he caught. And some guy had caught one, and it was like 688, 698 or 699. And he said before, this was in the middle of the game, he said somebody had offered him $100,000 for that baseball. I know. What? I was like, buyer beware. How would you prove the provenance of that? Right? How would you get to prove that was the ball caught at that game? I would definitely buyers beware. But isn't it nice to know as a Christian that you don't need to have any provenance to prove that you belong to God? That Christ is your provenance? That your faith in Jesus, that God already knows your heart? He knows your background. He knows where you come from. That if you accept Christ, that you are welcomed into God's family. That he, you are part of the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. That the Holy Spirit is your seal marking you for God's kingdom. That there's no doubt in God's eyes who you belong to. That should give our hearts great joy. That should give our hearts great encouragement. That God knows us. He knows when we repent and seek to live like him. He knows when we try to love one another and help in work in this kingdom. He knows that whether we're letting the Holy Spirit guide us and direct us or whether we're doing our own thing. Because we are adopted into God's family. When someone is adopted into a family, that never ends. You know, you adopt a little baby or maybe a child, and, and as they grow, that doesn't change. Even if you're re, as your relationships change, that relationship does not change, just like it doesn't change for natural children in a family. That God's act in salvation does not change for us in Jesus Christ. When we accept it, it's ours, and it's ours for eternity, This passage in Ephesians reminds us that God has done glorious work in us. And not just for us, but for the whole world. And our job and for the whole creation is to be out there sharing that good news in Jesus. And helping others come into that. Because what can separate us from our love from God? Nothing can separate the love God has for us. And so what can stop us if God is for us? Who is against us? No one and nothing can stop us. That's our hope and our great joy. But too often we don't open that gift, that gift given to us without price. Or we open a little part of it, but we don't open the whole thing. We don't live as adopted and beloved children of God. Maybe you remember the restaurant chain um, or the phrase that used to be out several years ago. It used to be TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. You know, in the in the in the um, in the farming world, that's irrelevant. <laughs> but, but in the working world, like not in the working world, but in the corporate world, where you used to have Monday through Friday, it used to be everybody's looking for Friday, working for the weekend, and all that. Thank God it's Friday. And of course, there was a restaurant chain adopted that name and then became Fridays. But our, our, our initials as Christians should be TGIA. Thank God I'm adopted. 
Thank God I belong to the kingdom. Thank God I have been chosen by God and that that cannot change. And when, when people welcome you in as part of their family, that's a wonderful thing. But think about God welcomes us in as part of his kingdom. And that's a powerful thing that can help us if we live it and believe it, do things that are very difficult to do otherwise. In chapter 4 of our book, um, Anxious for Nothing by Max Licato, he lifts up the story of Joseph, and Joseph is found in the last part of the book of Genesis, for those who might not be familiar with this story. Joseph is a younger son. In fact, I think he's the 11th out of 12 sons of Jacob. And so you wouldn't think, especially in that day and age, that the younger son had much influence or would be very popular in a family. But Joseph was the favorite son. Now, anybody who has brothers or sisters will know the favorite person can have problems by the other people. Yes, George, you are the favorite in our family. That's my brother. He was the little favorite in our family, and I don't care if he didn't say he was, he was. (laughs) I thought I should be since I was the only girl, but I wasn't. He was the favorite. Now, of course, that can make siblings jealous, and Joseph's family was no exception. Jacob favored Joseph so much that he made this beautiful coat of many colors. Now, we might discount a coat of many colors. We might think, why is somebody wearing that? Who would even wear that? But the reality of that time period was colors were very hard to come by. People mostly just wore natural linen. So it would be, you know, wool colored or tannish colored. They didn't, dyeing things color took time. It took money to buy the things to dye. It was a sign of wealth and prestige. And so that Joseph had a coat not just of one color, But that he had a coat of many colors showed not only the wealth of his family, but it also showed his prominence in the family. Excuse me. So he would be wearing, (laughs) choking on my cough drop. So he would wear this coat of colors around his other siblings. Think how that made them feel in their blah, blah, dre. And here he was in his beautiful outfit. Yeah. Well, that wasn't bad enough. Joseph also was a person who had the gift of interpreting dreams. Now, we don't talk about dreams so much in our world nowadays, but people still have a lot of dreams. And Joseph, back in that day, dreams were a way God communicated with his people quite often. And so Joseph had the gift of interpreting dreams, and he also had his own dreams. So he, being a 17-year-old kid, thought it was a great idea that he should share one of his dreams with his brothers, and this is the dream he had. He had a dream that they were all stalks of wheat, And he was a bigger stock of wheat, and their stocks of wheat were bowing down to him. Now, that meant that they would be bowing down to him. Don't you think that'd make you feel really good if you were one of Joseph's brothers? You're going to bow down to me. Of course, as I said, Joseph wasn't really smart as a 17-year-old kid aren't usually that smart. And so Joseph's brothers got furious with him. They wanted, Some of them wanted to kill him. Fortunately, they didn't make that choice. They sold him into slavery into Egypt. And Joseph had some really hard times as a slave into Egypt. But through all this, one thing Joseph did that is remarkable and worthy of our attention is that Joseph was confident that he belonged to God. He was confident that he was part of God's family. Not just that he was part of his important family, but that he was part of God's bigger family. That's why it's important for us to remember we're not just part of our own family. We're part of God's family. And there's a bigger story for us. And Joseph believed that God was near, even when lots of things would tell him otherwise. So in Egypt, Joseph had some really great times, and he had some really bad times. And at the end of Joseph's story, that dream he had came true, because there'd been a famine in the land, and Joseph's family, his brothers, had to bring the whole family to Egypt to find food. And Joseph at that time was very high up in Egypt, but of course he looked like an Egyptian. They had no idea what he looked like as their brother, their 17-year-old brother from years ago. 
And so they didn't know who he was. And so in order to get their, their food, those, they had to bow down to Joseph. And as they were doing that, Joseph finally told them the truth that he had known and lived with. What you intended for evil, you intended it for evil, selling me into slavery. God intended for good. And that's the important truth that all of us need to claim as God's people. There's lots of times in life when others intend evil for us, even the one looking in the mirror. Surely you've had times when you've done things and you said, that's not good for you, don't do it, and you do it anyway. Your bo- yourself is intending evil for you. And so sometimes you have to fight against that, but whatever is intended for evil for you as God's people, God is going to intend good. And so we have a choice. We can wear that bad attitude, the negative things that have going on, our hurt and pain, our brokenness, or we can dress in a new outfit of hope. We can wear our hope. How are you dressed today? Are you dressed in the intention of others that might, or your own bad intentions? Are you going to choose to believe the lies that people might say? Or are you going to choose to live like Joseph? And even when your circumstances may not say it, you're going to choose to believe God is intending things for good. It's not easy, of course, to dress in hope because our, the other clothes, those despair and discouragement from the world, they fit like a glove. They like to cling. It's easy to put those on. But we don't want to live in that brokenness and hurt of the world. We want to live in the perfect plan God has for us in Jesus Christ. It's not easy, but it is simple. We either believe that God is going to do better things, and we believe in God and live into his purpose that he has established for us, or we live in anxiety and defeat and brokenness. Either God is for us or he's not. Either we will live as people of faith or we will live as outsiders. We have been adopted. We don't have to live in the brokenness. Now, of course, that doesn't mean life is going to be perfect. As we said, Joseph's life wasn't perfect. People behave badly for no reason. Even the Apostle Paul, the writer of this great epistle, had his own struggles. He wrote in Romans, I don't do what I want to do. The bad I don't want to do, I do do. So he knows exactly what we're living through. He said, I'm a miserable person. Who can free me from this brokenness? Who can free me from this domination of sin and death? Who? The answer always is Jesus. Jesus can free us from our brokenness. Praise be to our great God. There is no condemnation for those who live in Jesus Christ because we are forgiven. That's the power of the cross. Jesus sets us free to put on our new outfit, to live as people of hope, to dress for success as people of faith. We can put on kindness and gentleness. We can put on a calmness that is contagious to our world. Or we can continue to live in the brokenness that this world offers us. But God has determined that all things, all things are going to come under Jesus Christ at God's appointed time. I myself want to live in all things right now under Jesus Christ. I'm not going to wait for God to put his appointed time into action because he's already put his appointed time into action in my life by giving me the call of faith, and you have it too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting in a church building on a Sunday morning. You'd find other things to do. And when you believe and put God's call of faith into your life in new ways, you know that, yeah, you may intend it for evil. It's obvious you do. But I'm going to trust the Lord to intend this for good, that he will bring it under Jesus Christ and transform it. If not in this world, then he certainly will in the world to to come. That's how we live as people of hope. We live in people of hope, not because of the reality that's around us, but because of the one who promises to make the change in things and because we see it evidenced in the life of people of faith. Our choice to live as Christians, above all else, should give us joy. And yes, it's going to be difficult and challenging at times, but this is not forever. The inheritance we have 
is for here and for there. And we as God's people, as God's beloved adopted children, can live into that inheritance now today. Amen? Amen. As we live into our inheritance, we're people of prayer. And Rodney sent the message that his wife, Maureen, has been cancer-free for two months because we, you know, because of prayer. God has healed. So we are praising God for that. And we want to keep our prayers coming. Dylan Phelps is out of the hospital. So is Janice Madsen. Both are out of the hospital. Uh, Larry Zelbert has a lot of healing to do. So please keep him in your prayers. We want to pray for the family of of Tim Donovan. Um, He passed away yesterday after a battle with several health issues. So please keep his family, Betty, and his daughter, his wife, Betty, and his daughter in your prayer and family in your prayers and friends at this difficult time. At this time, they are not planning any services. We want to also keep Jean Cooper, um, sister of Mary Delheimer, in our prayers. Her cancer has returned, so we'll keep Jean in the forefront of our prayers for victory over this cancer. We pray for others who still are having tests and waiting for procedures. We have many people that are out there with different things going on, and we want to keep those folks in our prayers. Jill Mann will have her knee surgery on the 10th, so please keep her in prayers as preparing for that. Um, Please keep all those folks battling cancer in your prayers. And we're so glad to see Jane Hoffman was at first service, but she's continuing to recover. So keep her in your prayers. Uh, Keep Wanda in your prayers as she continues to heal with her leg. Mary Picarney is continuing to heal from her shoulder. And Renee Hakey, so please keep all those folks in your prayers as they continue to knit back together. Keep Dave and Joyce Nelson in your prayers as he's continuing with his uh, cancer treatments um, daily, so that's a lot. So please keep them in your prayers. And others, uh, please keep those folks in your prayers. All right, well, let's go to God first silently and individually, knowing that God hears us and wants to hear from you as his beloved child. Uh, You can call on him, and please do. And we'll conclude with a pastoral prayer, and then we'll all join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to come to you as your adopted and beloved children chosen to be part of your family. Help us to live into that uh, important position in your family and in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you forgive us and and remove from us any sins that cause us not to be able to see that. Any evil that is intended for us, we just pray that you protect us and deliver us from that and from our families. We thank you, O Lord, for the good harvest we've seen, and we just pray that you continue to bless those who are continuing the harvest journey. We pray for our farmers and workers that you will protect them and encourage them, that you'll keep them safe and just bring a good harvest in for our world and for our community. We pray, O Lord, that you continue to bless our families, and especially tomorrow, let that be a day of safety as we enjoy some fun and and decorations, and just protect those little ones as they're out and about, and people who are out and about um, tomorrow night. Just give them safety and let them have a fun time. We ask, O Lord, that you especially be near those who are sick, and we are especially mindful, Lord, please, that you deliver folks who have serious health problems like Larry Zelbert and Dylan Phelps. We pray for Janice Madsen, and we thank you for the healings that we've seen in Mary Percarney and Renee, but we ask that you continue to knit them together. We pray your blessing on Jane and Wanda and others who continue to need your healing and encouragement, people waiting for tests and waiting for treatments, that you'll bless them this week. We pray for Jill as she's preparing for her surgery in another week or so, that 
You're preparing her body for that and protecting her from infection. We lift up all those battling cancer, and we know there are so many that fight that fight. We thank you for the good news Maureen has seen, and we pray your special anointing just rest on Jean Cooper, that you help her to have encouragement and give her doctors wisdom as they find a new treatment plan. We pray for Joyce and Dave Nelson as they deal with these prostate treatments, that these will be working effectively, and you'll give them all the support and help they need uh, to get through this time. We just pray for others that have unspoken concerns, Lord, that you're continuing to bless them and be with our new babies that are coming and their parents, that you just continue to bring them healthy into our world and continue to protect them as they make this last month journey. And we just think a little Knox and just are so excited to welcome him into our church family and into his new family. Lord, just bless them and bless all the folks who who need your encouragement today. Lord, show us people who could be part of the family but can't seem to make that change and help us to find words to say to invite them in and to show them the joy of belonging as a person of faith into your family. Lord, you've you've sent Jesus for the whole world, so we know that it's not that you exclude people, but that we exclude ourselves, and just remove all those impediments, and help us, Lord, to reach out to those who are lost, and to bring them back in. We thank you, Lord, for your great love that we do know best because of Jesus, and we lift all these things, our unspoken concerns, and all that we've lifted aloud, we lift them up in Jesus' precious name. And can we continue in our time of prayer, praying as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing praise. Great are you, Lord.
now receive the benediction. Good friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his presence before you and fill you to overflowing with his peace. Go forth in the name of our Lord, knowing that our God is with us. We are his beloved children. So let us go forth and live the faith we have. Amen. Amen.